Namaste. Welcome to another episode of Uladu Narpadu. So today we're going to take the 37th verse. And this is about the 10th man. Even the argument which says duality during sadhana which one undertakes due to not knowing the truth that one is always Brahman, and non-duality after attainment. That is, duality is true during the time of practice, and non-duality becomes true only after the attainment of self-realization. This is not true. Who else is one except the tenth man? both when one is anxiously searching for the tenth man and when one finds oneself to be the tenth man. What is this about the tenth man? Well, first let's take a look at this theory. This theory by some schools, uh, the Vishishta Dvaita, conditioned unconditionality. <laughs> which is, of course, self-contradictory, but let's not go into that. They say that non-duality is true as long as one is not enlightened. In other words, the world is real, the ego is real, the body, huh? all these activities, karma, God, all of this is real. Not just seems real, but it's really real. <laughs> until one attains enlightenment, and then all of a sudden non-duality is real, and everything else is an illusion. So Bhagavan, of course, doesn't accept this. He says that non-duality is always real, and duality is always unreal. How is that? Because we are always the self. We are never not the self. And the impression that one is something other than the self of all, Brahman, is an illusion. And the proof of that is it's temporary. It comes and goes. The fact that one can attain enlightenment, can realize non-duality, means that duality is false because it has an end. So one might say, well, it seems like non-duality has a beginning at the time of realization. So doesn't that also make it temporary? No, because non-duality was actually the case the whole time. It was just covered by the illusion of duality. That is the actual Advaita theory. Now let's talk about the tenth man. The story goes, there was a group of ten men. Not too bright. <laughs> anyway, they were on a, a trip and they came to a river. So they had to cross the river. The river was flowing very fast. And if you've had any experience crossing swollen rivers, it doesn't take much to sweep someone off their feet, knock them into the current, and they just disappear. So especially up in the Himalayas, you have to be careful about this. Anyway, so the men went across the river, and when they reached the other side, they said, oh, we better, we better count everybody and make sure that everybody made it. So the first one starts counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. But there's only nine. Wait a minute, you, you try it. And so the, the other one counts too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh my God, we lost somebody in the river. There used to be 10, what happened? So they were all upset. And then 
another traveler comes along and he hears them lamenting. And he says, wait a minute, there's 10 of you. I count 10 of you. And they said, well, we all tried and we only counted nine. And he goes, wait a minute. I'm going, you all line up and I'm going to come and slap each man on the back. And then you all count off. So, okay, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And they're going, oh, duh, wait a minute. I guess we are ten men. But what happened to the tenth man when we were counting? And the traveler says, you dummies. <laughs> Each of you was counting the others and not counting yourselves. So the answer to the problem of the 10th man, the riddle, is this is how we go through life. Our culture trains us to be compulsively extroverted. And we count everything outside of ourselves, but we don't count ourselves. We're conscious of so many things, objects, people, actions, and so on. But we're not conscious of our consciousness. We're even conscious of the mind and the body and so many things but we're never conscious of ourselves, our real self, our consciousness. The body, the mind, all those things are actually external to the self. And of course, again, the proof is <laughs> they come into being at a certain point and they pass away later on. But the consciousness that's aware of them is always there, without beginning, without end. So that's our problem. That's why we're not enlightened. We're not fully aware of our own self. So this has led to some very strange phenomena. For example, oh, one thing came up just this morning, the myth of the enlightenment experience. Huh? In Zen, it's called Kensho. In yoga, it's called Samadhi. Huh? Enlightenment experience is actually an oxymoron. An oxymoron means a term or expression that is inherently self-contradictory. Because enlightenment is not an experience. Experiences come and go. They begin, they happen, and then they pass away. Huh? I don't care, even the greatest enlightenment experience, you know, seeing God or whatever, huh, is going to be like that, just temporary. So you can't hold on to it and say, oh, now I'm enlightened, I had this experience, because the experience passes away. You don't pass away, though. You remain. You meaning consciousness, the self. But many unrealized teachers teach this myth of the enlightenment experience. Why? Because it gives their students maybe something to cling to or something to chase after. Huh? It gives them a way to sell themselves and sell their teachings and so on. Because it seems tangible, you know? It seems uh, legit, right? <laughs> seems legit, <laughs> but it's not, it's a con. And the reason it's a con is because everyone is suffering from the 10th man syndrome. Everyone is looking outside themselves, counting all these things, huh? Body, yeah, check. Mind, check. Yeah, ego, check. <laughs> Possessions, check. Activities, check. 
Karma, oh, well, check. <laughs> but where is the self? Where is the one to whom all these experiences happen? What about that one? What about the I am? What about, even better, I, I? Objectless awareness. See, this is the real unconditioned nature of the being. No outside experiences or objects at all. So, in this way, uh, unrealized teachers are fooling people, selling them on these experiences, which aren't enlightenment at all. Now, granted, they can be a milestone on the path, especially the Buddha. He uh, talked about these four paths uh, and also the Noble Eightfold Path. But one time, a lady came, a visitor, I think she might have been a monk, and asked the Buddha, is the Eightfold Path a fabrication? The Buddha said, yes. Ah, what does that mean? <laughs> well, we talked in the esoteric teaching series about the path being a process of becoming. So a process of becoming, any process of becoming, has the same steps, and it begins from fabrication. Gestation, remember, we broke up the stage of gestation into fabrication, then name and form, and consciousness, uh, it begins from ignorance in the fall. But the process of becoming in the path begins from knowledge. It begins from right view. And then at the time of initiation, fabrication takes place. Fabrication of the becoming of an enlightened being, the real self. And then the rest of the path is simply working that out through the other stages. This is something you have to figure out for yourself. And if you don't get it, then you have to ask someone who does. Anyway, these stages on the path are not enlightenment themselves. They're simply experiences that show you have reached a certain level in the process of becoming, a certain stage in becoming, going back to your original self, your real self. Actually, it's, a, it's a, not so much a process of becoming as a process of unbecoming, letting go of all the false identities of body, mind, intellect, ego, desire, ignorance, and delusion. Once we can let go of all these things, the real self is uncovered. It's been there all along. Huh? Just like the tenth man was there the whole time. But just because the others were caught up in extroversion, not counting themselves, they missed it. But we're the same way. When we're caught up in compulsive extroversion, enforced by schooling, culture, family life, work, finances, and politics, and all this crap, we think, oh, I don't count. I'm nothing. So we don't count ourselves. We're not even aware of ourselves. But when we finally clear away all these coverings, then we see, oh, actually, I'm the one who's doing the counting. I'm the one who is aware. I am the self. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om. <laughs>